Hi, I'm Diana North. I'm a general practitioner and I work for the Goodfellow Unit at the University of Auckland. Today we're talking about paediatric asthma. We're lucky to have with us today David McNamara, a paediatric respiratory physician who works at the Starship. Hi David. Hi. David, we see a lot of wheezy children in general practice. Is there anything new in the diagnosis of asthma in children? There's no real changes in the diagnosis of asthma. There is more of an emphasis on a clinical pattern of presentation. So more of an emphasis on recognising a typical pattern of symptoms such as wheeze, cough and shortness of breath in association with the usual triggers of viruses, exercise, cold air and dust. Uh, there is an important emphasis on recognising a response to treatment with preventers and finalising the diagnosis. We used to do serial peak flow recordings in children. What investigations should we consider doing now? Um, there's no real need for any objective testing in primary care. The diagnosis and monitoring is really based on symptoms uh, rather than monitoring peak flow. We do some testing in secondary care, but that's really when we're questioning the diagnosis rather than confirming it. There is some debate from overseas that we're over-diagnosing asthma in children. Yeah, because wheeze is such a common symptom, there is a tendency to over-diagnose asthma. We need to be careful about children who might have bronchiectasis or cystic fibrosis. So those children can be recognised by a recurrent or chronic productive cough. The other group is children who just have occasional wheeze with viruses and they should just be treated with relievers and not labelled as having asthma. Having diagnosed asthma, what are the goals of treatment for children? We really want to get children as well as possible with no symptoms, and so they should be able to engage in all the normal activities and sports that they want to. But we have to balance that against side effects of medication, and that's why we advocate a stepwise approach. Thinking more about stepped care, if I was a child coming and seeing you with newly diagnosed asthma, what education and lifestyle advice would you give me? So parents have told us they want to know about the whys of looking after their children's asthma and just not just the hows, and that's so that they can adapt the care when they need to. So an asthma education would start with looking at the pathophysiology of the disease, particularly focusing on narrowed airways and bronchospasm and the underlying inflammation which needs treatment. The next thing to talk about would be triggers and avoiding triggers. And then it would be good to talk about how the treatment is managed, talking about relievers and preventers. Lastly, it's very important to talk about when to seek help in an emergency. That's quite a lot of ground to cover, so it's really good to break it up in chunks and present the education over a series of visits. Thinking about lifestyle advice in particular, is there anything new we need to know? It's important to avoid any triggers that you know will set off the child's symptoms and common things would be cats. In the past we've spent a lot of effort talking about getting rid of house dust mite and house dust mite allergens and unfortunately all that effort just doesn't pay off and it doesn't work. So we can drop that advice for now. I assume that passive smoking is still an issue for some children. Yes, passive smoking is a big issue for Maori and Pacific Island kids and it would be good to give advice about avoiding environmental tobacco smoke exposure. The other things we need to think about are healthy housing and most DHBs would have some sort of healthy housing program to get rid of damp and cold housing. And the last thing to remember is the flu vaccine, particularly at this time of year. Is there any point in doing any allergy testing on these children? If there's a single allergen that you really suspect is causing a problem, like a particular plant at the school or at the home, then it's worth checking for that. Um, the other situation might be a favourite family pet, pet that the family's reluctant to get rid of, but there's really no place for generalised or blanket aeroallergen testing. And we're talking about just the skin prick test rather than doing any further investigation? Uh, well, there's two choices. There's the skin prick testing or blood testing with RAST. Uh, RAST testing is quite expensive, and, um, but it does have the advantage that it's less painful than multiple skin prick tests. But I think in the first instance, skin prick testing would be the first choice. Looking at stepped management 
for asthma in children. Let's focus on children under the age of five. So the first step for treatment of, of wheeze is just using an as-needed reliever like salbutamol when the child has episodes of wheeze. If the child has frequent symptoms, and we can divide kids under five into two groups, there are those who have frequent severe exacerbations that are bad enough to see a doctor, and there are those who have symptoms between their exacerbations. So those who have the severe exacerbations, their best first line treatment as a preventer on step two would be to use Montelukast, which is an oral anti-inflammatory. For the children who have regular symptoms between viruses, the best first line treatment for them would be an inhaled corticosteroid. If the child remains poorly controlled on those treatments, then we would advance to step three. We recognise poor control by asking certain specific questions, and the questions I would ask would be firstly, in a usual week, how often does the child have wheeze during the day? Secondly, how often do they wake at night with cough or, or wheeze? Thirdly, how often do they need to use their reliever medication during a usual week? And lastly, can they take part in normal exercise and sport without symptoms? If they're poorly controlled, then the next step would be simply to add the other medication. So for a child who started on Montelukast, you would add an inhaled corticosteroid, whereas a child who started on an inhaled corticosteroid, you would add the Montelukast. I'm always a little anxious about prescribing steroids in children under the age of five. So children are more vulnerable to the side effects of inhaled corticosteroids than adults, so we do use lower doses. Particularly, we have a lower maximal dose compared to adults. So in a child under five, the maximal recommended inhaled corticosteroid is only 200 micrograms per day of fluticasone, or the equivalent is the 400 micrograms of budesonide. Is there any role for using long-acting beta agonists in children under five years of age? Long-acting beta agonists, or labbers, are not licensed for use in children under five. And because of the past concerns with severe exacerbations of asthma with these medications, I would not use them in this age group. Let's now move on to those over the age of five and under the age of 16. Is there any differences in how we should be treating these children? There are quite a few significant differences. The first step is the same, so that is using a bronchodilator as needed when they have symptoms. For children who are poorly controlled on that or have frequent flare-ups of their asthma and would recognise poor control asking those same questions, then step two would be starting an inhaled corticosteroid as a preventer. And that should be started at a dose that's consistent with the severity of symptoms. If they remain poorly controlled on a low dose of inhaled corticosteroid, then the next step is either to increase that to a moderate dose or to add a long-acting beta agonist. Once they're on a moderate dose of inhaled corticosteroid and a labber, if they're poorly controlled at that point, then we're talking about adding oral medications. But I think we also need to really reconsider the diagnosis and be referring to a specialist for further assessment. The first line oral medication would be Montelukast, which again has funding criteria through Pharmac on the special authority. It strikes me that to get good absorption of this medication, we may need to use different devices for different ages. Tell me what you currently recommend. So for very young children, that's those under four, I would start with a metered dose inhaler with a spacer and a mask. By four years of age, they should be able to coordinate enough to remove the mask and be able to use the spacer with the mouthpiece. We can start using dry powder inhalers, like inhalers from about seven years of age, but it's very important to check that the child is using the inhaler correctly. And there's no reason not to use a MDI and a spacer all the way through adulthood. I hear that there is a new medication out that is a once a day medication that we can use in children, which is a inhaled corticosteroid plus a LABA, but it's a lot stronger. Can you tell me a little bit about this? There are a number of new inhaled corticosteroids around. The fluticasone furoate, which comes with the long-acting beta agonist Valanterol, is four times more potent than standard budesonide, so it can be given once a day. 
but the Valanterol part of the product is only licensed in patients over 12 years of age, so we can't use it in young children. The other inhaled corticosteroids to be aware of are the ultra-fine beclomethazone inhaler, which is marketed as QVAR. Again, these are like standard fluticasone propionate, these are twice as strong as the old budesonide and beclomethazone we used to use. So you need to be careful to use half the dose compared to um, budesonide. It sounds like we need to be really aware of these newer products so that we don't risk over-treating children with inhaled corticosteroids. Yes, yeah, so children are quite vulnerable to inhaled corticosteroids, particularly in that they get growth side effects, which is not a problem that adults experience. Um, so for children over five, because we've already talked about the maximal dose under five, the maximal dose of inhaled corticosteroid would be 500 micrograms per day of the standard fluticasone propionate or the equivalent's 800 micrograms per day of the budesonide. An important part of looking after children safely with asthma is the use of the personalised action plan. How do we write these? So action plans are a great opportunity for education. You know, it's a chance to sit down and go through the pathophysiology and the treatment with the patient or the caregiver. An action plan should tell the parents how to manage the disorder on a day-to-day -day basis and then how to manage any flare-ups. The most important part from my point of view is that they should tell parents how to seek help in an emergency. The action plan should use language for medication like preventers and relievers, and it's best to have the emergency contact number 111 there as well. I think it would be really great to attach to this talk a couple of options for action plans, and we'll make sure that that is available on the Goodfellow website. There's a really good asthma action plan with the Asthma and Respiratory Foundation website. There's also the Pictorial Asthma Management Plan, which is nice and simple and is easy to use even if patients or their caregivers have English as a second language. It has been great talking to you today, David. What are the three things you would like us to remember about the care of asthma in children? Firstly, check asthma control at every visit, even if the patient's presented with another problem. And that means using those asthma control questions that we talked about before. Secondly, get the patient to demonstrate their inhaler technique to you. And that might mean reminding them to bring their spaces or their inhaler devices with them to your practice. Thirdly, use your recall systems to get the patients back for follow-up. With the diagnosis, we want to see a response to therapy. And with a stepwise approach, we want to increase therapy if they're poorly controlled and decrease therapy once we've achieved control. Thank you, David. The management of wheeze in general practice is going to continue to be a common problem, particularly in winter. I think the three key points that David has raised are important for us to remember and to take time in general practice to manage asthma tightly and correctly for each individual child.